It doesn't work? Oh, yeah. Hello, please. Quiet. Thank you. We would start with the event. So, hello, everyone. And first of all, thank you for attending this event organized by the Reyes Association. And it's a pleasure to have you all here in person and meeting you, as well as for the persons who are coming here virtually and joining us online. And before coming to the topic that's going to be discussed here on stage today, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Maximilian Kelm. I am the current president of the Reyes Association, and I am here today to represent our team and to show you what we are having planned for you today with the speech. And exactly that's what I'm going to tell you afterwards in more detail. So I'm happy to introduce today our speaker of this event, Jose Carlos Torres, who is the acquisitions director at Hines here in Madrid. And after he has studied at the Site uh, Business School at Oxford, he has held numerous positions within the real estate industry sector. And among others, Mr. Torres is the professor of the real estate program at the EA Business School here in Madrid. And we are uh, more than pleasure to have him here today with us. And uh, together, we will deep dive into the fascinating uh, topic of acquisitions and depositions um, in order to study together the dynamics of flows in the real estate investments. And before completely giving the microphone away, I just want to mention to you all that at 8.15 we would like to start the questioning session and afterwards at 8.30 I would really like for all of you being outside enjoying our drinks and foods. And now without further ado, I will hand the microphone to Mr. Torres. I think I... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maximilian, for uh, your very kind and very nice intro. Um, honestly, I'm not very used to talk about myself. I'm very used to talk about uh, transactions. I've been a transaction guy for my entire career, almost my entire career. But the reality is that I didn't realize what I wanted to do when I was your seat guys. So this is about trying to explain you the rational process I have personally followed during my career to end up doing what I like to do, what I love to do, what I'm passionate about. Okay? If this is helpful, uh, if this is inspirational, it will, be, it will have been a fantastic day uh, for me. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So, why this guy is talking about his career just starting with this? I'm doing this because I see in my career a very strong parallelism between what has happened in the cycle and the decisions I have done personally on, on my career. Why? Because you like it or not, you're determined by your context, right? You're determined by many things, that are, many things that are around us. Some of them we can control, but many of them we cannot. And, and that's the truth. We, we, we need to live with that. And, and that's absolutely true. So if you you are here to, to, to hear my, my, my story, my journey, my learning journey, my professional journey. And I cannot explain that without explaining this very briefly, just a couple of minutes, because most of you, almost all of you, you are not, not a Spanish. And the reality is that the cycle in Spain has been slightly different in, than in other parts of the world. And uh, at the same time, this is about deal flow. This is, all, this is about investment. We cannot talk about investment and acquisitions and dispositions without understanding the macro story that is behind that. Okay, so back in the days, if you see a humongous uh, period of growth in the Spanish economy that generated a huge bubble, huge bubble in real estate, it was the same all, all across the world, yes, but with a specific situation in, in, in Spain during those years, Germany, for instance, the anchor of the EU, it was, it was suffering. It was, it was going through a, a, a strong pain by, by, by then. So that means that Germany had a strong incentive to keep interest rates very low. While the Spain was growing a lot, inflation was high and interest rates were very low. 
which is not the right thing to do, right? You know that. So the Bible in Spain was much bigger than in other parts of the world for that specific reason. That's the reason behind, the main reason behind. And then we get burst massively and harmfully uh, and, and unfortunately. I started my career in 2003, 2003 roughly. So my first, my first years they were beautiful. Well, it grows, 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 grows. Everything was fantastic. And it used to be that way for years. So really, many people were saying, hey, Spain should go down the, the cycle at some point. But it didn't. It took longer. But it went deeper, much, much deeper. And during the global financial crisis, um, it went through a very, very strong pain. Obviously, that determined my career in many ways. Because by then, I started to know what I want to do. But I was determined by the, by the, by the situation. Then Spain recovered, and recovered mainly, and this is just macro story, it, it, it recovered mainly because of what is, you can see there. The act done by the Spanish government to do a mark-to-market -market provision of real estate assets. That's the main reason why the Spanish real estate market recovered much later than other places in the world. Because prior to that, the real estate owners that ended up being banks and financial institutions, by the way, at that moment we had like 50 plus in Spain. Today we have less than 10. Massive consolidation of the financial sector because of that. But before that, really, financial institutions who ended up owning real estate, had, they had no incentive to sell real estate assets. Not at all. Nothing. Why? I have a book value much higher than market value. I'm not a stupid. If I can hold them, just hold them. The reality, no trade. Nothing. With a lot of junk in the balance of the banks. And after that, a quite, I would say, long and strong period of recovery, which has been really interesting in a, in a, in a different way. So when I'm talking about massive drop in trading, and we're talking also about not only about me, I will go through that later, but also we are talking about the investment flow. Look at such a sharp decrease. It, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I feel it, it's, it's pretty amazing, really. I mean, we, we, we went down massively four times. But the recovery was amazing, also. Why well, it was so strong recovery, by the way, much stronger than in the, in the average, in the global perspective. Basically because I haven't seen a period in time where two magic things happen at the same time. A huge amount of product and a huge amount of money at the same time. Normally, you don't have both. You have one or you have the other. But it's very rare to find both at the same time. And this is what happened, really. At the same time, the number of unlisted vehicles, which is basically real estate funds, guys, were growing and growing and growing. All that what has had to do with myself. I'll go to that one later. Because this is my career, exactly. And I put that in context with the real estate cycle, or the economic cycle. In 2002, I was coming back from my Erasmus program in the Netherlands. And I was very clear and honest to me that I didn't want to, I, I wanted something different. So I started as a trainee in an IT company nothing to do with real estate. Honestly, I had no real estate vocation at all. I don't know if you, if the first day you were born, you knew that you wanted to be real estate guys. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. And I doubt that has not been the same for you. 
probably. So basically, I started business administration because I had no vocation at all. That's, that's, that's the truth. But you know, during the 2000s, it, it looks fancy to be in an IT company. So I joined uh, Amena, which was a subsidiary of the French group Orange Telecom, in the trade marketing department. A lot of fun, really a lot of fun at that moment. Nothing to do with real estate. But the internship finished, and I had to make a decision. And these guys in yellow, Savills, together with Aguirre Newman, now they are the same company. They, used, they, they, they were not the same company by, by then. It was just Aguirre Newman, who was the largest Spanish advisory real estate company in, in, in Spain. They had an agreement with, with, um, with Orange, and they knew me because of that. They told me, hey, we are hiring. Do you want to join? OK. It was lazy to look for another job, so I said yes. They knocked to my door, why not? Cool. And I started my first days, my first months, my first years in, um, in the real estate industry as an agent, just leasing units in shopping centers, which I'm very proud of. Why? Because my first approach to real estate was through the needs of tenants. All this is about tenants. Most of it is about tenants. If you really understand the needs of tenants, you know a lot of real estate. And at the same time, I had the chance to interact a lot with the property management team. And it was my first approach to real estate funds. Why? Because all the shopping centers were owned, or most of them were owned by real estate funds, four-inch real estate funds. So I, I kind of started to understand that I knew very little, basically, by, by then. Good. After a year and a half, roughly, I joined the Capital Markets Department as an analyst, associate, blah, blah, blah. I ended up being the head of real estate capital markets for retail, basically, and freak stuff. Uh, so no offices. Hmm. Mostly retail. 90% of my job was, was, uh, was retail. Why? Because I did leasing for a year and a half, with 24 years. Nothing special, but a great moment. Very entrepreneurial. Say, so, okay, this is the, the, the guy who knows about retail in the capital markets department. Let's go for it. Fantastic. And once I joined the, real, the capital markets department, I started to realize, hey, about this. Just a little. Where does the money was coming from? I'm pretty sure that before seeing this slide, if I ask to any of you guys who are the main investors in the world in real estate, you would have mentioned most of the guys in that list and very few of the guys in this list. Which the reality is the opposite. Basically, the guys in that list, where I am, what we do is look, we look for money from these guys with an investment proposition, with a great idea. Let's go for logistics, last mile in Europe, and let's create a platform. Okay, great, sounds, sounds like a great idea. I want to diversify. The Japan Pension Fund, I think that chart is from 2018 or 2017. It was the largest investor in the world by then. Did any of you know somebody who worked in the Japanese pension fund? No. Not me either. But you know all, the, all, all those names. So I started to realize how, you know, the, the, this, this world of real estate investment work and how the capital markets work. Just to start to realize, have no idea. But I was making a lot of questions to everyone. That's, that's very true. So getting back to my story, the crisis came and it was ahead of retail capital markets. There was no trading of shopping centers at all. Not a single shopping center was traded between 2008 and 2009. So it was not that smart and it took me a year and a half to realize about that, <laughs> really. So I had to change my mind. What can I do? And then, I had a smart idea, together with my team. Say, okay, 
There is no trade at shopping centers at what can be traded. And we had two interesting things in the market. We've got plenty of financial institutions, remember, more than 50, who are oversized with bank subsidiaries and desperate for capital and willing to do sale at lease banks. And Bank of Santander was a pioneer of selling through a sale at lease structure a massive number um, of uh, bank subsidiaries. In fact, it, it was the largest uh, real estate transaction in, in Spain ever, four, four billion back in the days. But we convinced a number of financial institutions that instead of going through the pain of selling to a private equity, why don't we sell unit by unit to private individuals? Because after more than 10 years of growth, the number of high net worth individuals in Spain grew massively. They had a lot of money. And by, the, by that moment, financial institution, institutions had a very good reputation. Maybe not today, but in 2009 they had. So we convinced a number of financial institutions to divest, and this is also about divesting, through that route. And people told us that we were crazy, absolutely crazy. How are you going to sell a 1 million euro subsidiary in a 50,000 population city in the middle of nowhere? Well, we did, and we were extremely successful. But in 2011, we were done. We traded millions of, and millions of bank subsidiaries. And honestly, it was not even challenging for me anymore. Okay, that was fine. But, you know, what else? I made myself that question, what else? And by then I was kind of understand that I wanted to be on that list. I didn't want to be an agent anymore. It was fine. It was great, in fact. I learned so much about the basics and the fundamentals of this business, but I was done. I was, it, it was over for me because, basically because of this. The trading figures were so low it was really desperating to, to, to do transactions. So, back, back to my story. These books here mean the moments in my career where I decided that I need more, more study. I need to introduce things in my, in my career Personally, I need to invest in knowledge. So I did several programs. I did two programs in, in the Instituto Empresa. I became RICS, a charter surveyor. I did an internal program at Aguirre Newman. And it was an eye-opener to me in many ways. Exactly what you guys are doing. So congratulations. You are doing the right thing to do. Absolutely. You might think in some moment that I'm not getting a return, an immediate return, but that's wrong. This is an eye-opener. You're listening to guys like me, to people much, very different to me, and that's fantastic. You're out of your comfort, and that's great. So I wanted to be an investor, but there were very few investors in the, in the market by, by that moment. Very, very few. I mean, Everybody, everybody was, was burned, basically because nobody saw by then where was the limit in the price decrease. When you, don't, when you don't see the bottom, you just wait and wait and wait and postpone investment decisions. And that was exactly what was happening at that moment in the cycle. So my only chance to become an investor was to join the investment arm of Aguirre Newman. It was Safir. If you know, if you know CBRE Global Investors, it's a kind of the same, but a much lower um, size. 
Okay. So Sapphire, it used to manage four discretionary funds that were fully invested, so no more dry powder by that moment. But Sapphire had a great thing that many few players in the market had, which was basically local knowledge. The Sapphire had been on the ground for a long, long time, had a team on the ground with a lot of expertise and a lot of asset management capabilities. And what that was fantastic for smart guys that in 2013 they realized that because of all the new improvements made by the new government, the cycle was going to turn, down, to turn up at some moment. And it turned up very quickly and very strongly. And I'm talking about guys like Lone Star. I'm talking about guys like Blackstone, Bardi. At some point, Baupost. We spend a lot of time with Baupost. I don't know if you know these guys. They're probably one of the most smart investors I've met in my life. You wouldn't have heard about them. But they are great. And the origin of Baupost, and just a minute on that, it was founded by a guy who's known, his name is Seth Clerman. He was a student at, at Harvard. He was so smart that some professors, and professors in Harvard, they really make money. It's not like us, right? <laughs> they make true money. <laughs> uh, and he set up a fund for the family of some, of, uh, some professors. And Harvard also co-invested in that fund. Baupos has, del has delivered plus 15% return every year since 1981, with the exception of two years. The most su successful investor that I've seen. There is no way that you can invest in Baupos unless you work in Baupos today. They don't admit any capital. So just, okay. So great, I became an investor with no money. So we went out to find guys who wanted to invest alongside with us. And we found Baupost, we found Oak Tree, we found Green Oak, D Show, a number of people that wanted to invest alongside with us. And during that process, we say, hey, we are good. Why don't we raise a fund ourselves? Let's go out for money and let's try to set up a discretionary vehicle. Did we succeed? No. We knocked too many doors. We hired Goldman Sachs. We hired other investment bankers, but we didn't succeed. Because we went too late, maybe. Because maybe our track record was not so good. But it was probably one of my best experiences in my professional career. Going there to London on a trip asking for money, with a reason to ask for money, with an idea to ask for money. It was extremely frustrating at that moment because we, we had a, a lot of expectations and excitement about raising our own fund and become a part of something with a great f future, a brilliant future, but it didn't happen. And looking back, I think it's one of the best things that had happened to me in, in, in my life because I just learned so much about the mindset of investors, why investors deploy capital with you or with other guy. It was extremely eye-opener to me. But I know that now, not then. By then I was hungry. So something that I say to you guys is that frustration in your career is not a bad thing to to get and to have. You can learn so much about frustration if you do it, if you use it in the, in the right way. Okay, so anyway, I spent a great time and I worked alongside with all these smart, smart investors, all of them private equity companies, which was an absolutely different animal to the kind of players that we had in the market before the global financial crisis. Most of private equities and hedge funds, they don't have a real estate focus. You know that. They can invest in real estate. They have 
a real estate arm that is growing and growing. It's true, it's became, it's became more and more important, but it's just a part of the, of the things they do. So that means that they're not emotional about real estate. They just see real estate as an asset class to invest, to make money. Basically, they see real estate interesting because they find it is not transparent enough. So in other words, in a market, it's not enough transparent. You can make money being more smart than your competitor, having better partners, better knowledge, better no local, uh, local knowledge, blah, blah, blah. And these guys are great doing that. And they're also great selecting the markets where they want to invest. It's just a micro play, right? Have you heard about the alpha and beta in real estate? Did you? Yes? No? Okay. These guys are fantastic. Identifying the alpha. And they're quite good identifying somebody who's great doing the, the, the beta. So this is exactly what they do. Okay, so in 2017, the company, Agurinium and Sapphire, it was for sale. And they didn't want to wait to the result of that sale, because maybe the investment arm was part of the sale, or maybe not. It happened to be, but it could have been a different way. So I decided to move. And I moved to Redefco. Redefco is a Dutch manager. We'll talk about Redefco later with some examples. We specialize in retail. It was roughly 10, per, 10 billion portfolio in, 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 in Europe, in retail. And I moved from a local investor to a European investor. It was a niche investor, not exactly what I wanted, because I used to be a retail guy, then at Sapphire I did everything almost, and then I became a retail guy again. But I put the balance and it was okay for me, because I wanted to be an international investor, at least European, at that European level. It was fine for me. And I didn't want to wait to see how the sale of the company uh, performed. That's the truth. After two years at Redefco, I joined Heinz. Heinz had the beauty of being absolutely global, global footprint. If you look back to these guys, you can see in the list Heinz number four in real estate investors in the world. They have a Fantastic, Heinz has a fantastic reputation for excellence, for being probably the best office developer in the world. So super specialist, but at the same time, they do everything. And they do a lot of development, which I didn't have that much experience. So altogether, it was a great proposition to me. So, with all this long story, I would like to use some examples of what I have done on the transaction side to go into the details of my professional career. This is a transaction that we did together with Bow Post in 2013. We bought a dead mall. It was a dead mall, really in Alicante, medium-sized city in, in, in Spain, at 200K, oh, sorry, 200 euros per square meter building. So it's literally for free. It was about to be closed, and it was really a dead mall for, for different reasons. Why? Because basically it was a middle-sized shopping center with a piece of um, retail warehouse, a really crappy outlet center, and a leisure area. It was not dominant in any of those sub-uses. It was in a market that, was, that had one of the highest GLA ratios per inhabitant in, in Spain. So what are we doing with that? First thing, it was cheap enough, extremely cheap. 
Many people have told me, especially advisors, that they have used this transaction as an example of <coughs> the most opportunistic transaction that has been done in the market in, in Spain. That in, in a way was like the milestone of the change of the cycle. <coughs> and what did we see? What did we saw at that moment? What we saw is an opportunity to do in the, basically the opposite, to create a big, big dominant outlet center in Alicante. Why? Because Alicante was a touristic place. Thank you. And maybe local people don't go to shopping centers, but tourists, they go to outlets. But they need to be nice enough and big enough. And this was not nice. It was not big. So you can see what we bought and the transformation. I'm really proud of this transaction. Not, not only because of the result that I am. We bought it for 9 million. It was traded for 34. Not because of the pictures. You can say a beautiful transformation and a successful transformation. I'm proud because we had a thesis that was right. The only way to have a thesis is to be extremely close to the market. Probably be without my agent background, I wouldn't have been able to generate the conviction to my investors of going for this transaction. But I had the knowledge. And I was able to create that knowledge and transform that knowledge into an investment opportunity with a story that was special and was appealing. And I was able to convince them. And the results came. And, and that was great. Obviously, without buying that chip, it was taking a lot of risk. That's very true. But it was a great successful. Next one. Unfortunately, because of COVID, probably you haven't been there, or maybe you have. It's one of the most important private touristic attractions in Madrid, together with the Bernabeu, Bernabeu Stadium tour, Mercado San Miguel. It's a beautiful and long story. I'm not going to bore, bore you guys with, with this, but the reality is that, that what, this was in hands of a bunch of investors that were angry between them, so a kind of disruption in the situation. They were willing to trade the company, not, not just the asset, but the company who owns the asset, with 50 plus employees, 50 plus employees. It was a pure operational business. I'm pretty sure that you are hearing more and more that real estate is becoming operational. The hotelization of real estate, you heard that, right? It's very much in the mouth of everyone. And this is a beautiful example of that. Most of the players, most of the investors, didn't want to touch it. Yes. They were looking at this transaction with the wrong eyes. Why? Because they were seeing uh, an asset with 1,200 square meters that intended to be traded at 70 million euros. If you made the calculation of the capital value, it's roughly 60K per square meter. This asset has been the most expensive asset per square meter ever traded in Spain. And probably that one was the cheaper one. And both are, are right. Both are great investments. What was the beauty of that? The beauty of that is that regardless of what I'm paying, we made the effort, because Redefco was an expert in doing that, of how the tenants were performing. So in other words, how they can afford to, what they can afford to pay. 
where people were seeing a massive over-rented situation, we saw the opposite. These guys were not presenting annual accounts, sorry, they were not presenting sales, not turnover, no turnover data. So we went to the registry and asked for uh, the P&L of every tenant, very, very tiny tenant. And assuming that many of them were cheating, the trading numbers were so amazing. We're talking about, and I'm not going to, to, to mention specific names, but some of the footholds was one that just, it was incredible. Six meters, six square meters foothold was trading a million euros per year. You can make the calculation on how much this guy can afford to pay on a per square meter basis to be on a healthy FO rate. That's exactly the calculation we did. And we bought the, we bought the, the, the Mercado San Miguel together, together with Aries. Aries is a private equity company that they, they buy business everywhere. They don't care. They also have a very strong real estate arm, but they had the mindset to go into an operational business. And basically what we did is what we sold the operational business, we transformed operations into real estate traditional leases, and we increased rents on all those people that we knew, we had conviction that they had much more room to pay more. They were super angry for one month. It was a queue of more, of more than 100 tenants willing to enter the market. So your bargaining power is massive when you have that situation. And real estate investors didn't want to touch this at all. Believe me, at all. They told us that we were crazy. We were competing against a local brewing company that wanted to create like kind of museum in Madrid. That was a competitor, not a real estate competitor. No other real estate investor saw what we saw. So again, the beauty of being local, because, because Redefco had a local team, but at the same time of being an expert in a niche. And this is the reason they succeed. In one year, valuation grew about like by 70 or 80 percent, just one year after doing of the releasing of the, of the market. And the last one is the largest built to rent scheme in Spain on one single project, which is an ongoing project in Valdebebas in Madrid, in the northeast of Madrid, close to the airport. And I'm, I like this, year, this one because we think this is going to be a success because we have been able to import all the built to rent knowledge that Heinz has accumulated uh, across the, the story of Heinz, basically, and across the, 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 the world. Heinz is a pr local presence in 27 countries. So that means that you have access to a massive experience across the cycles and across different jurisdictions. And if you are smart enough to cherry pick in of what you think you can import to that, you can do something special. I think it's going to be one of the most special built rent schemes in Spain. Honestly, I, I, I really believe that. But we faced a very strong problem when we, were, when we were underwriting this. There were no comms. This is a nascent market, right? It used to be absolutely in 2008. So how to get, again, super strong word, conviction of what we are doing, why this is the right thing to do? We had no comms. But I just mentioned before that doing investments only because of comms without understanding your tenant, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I learned that very well, as I told you. So we did a property listing, a blind listing in the, in the media during the due diligence process, which is that. When the broker, was colliers, they did that just to test the market, just to test the appetite. Would we found, are we going to be able to find tenants for that project, 400 units, 6,000 square meters of retail? More than 1,000 people picked the phone in one week. Wow. 
at those prices. Fantastic. Great confirmation. Together with that, we also did the specific surveys to people in meeting rooms, asking them what you will be able to pay in such a location with these amenities, blah, blah, blah. Everything confirmed the thesis. And from an effort rate perspective, it all makes sense. We went for that. Valdebebas had been in the market. There was plenty of available land by that time for years and years. And nobody didn't want to touch it for built to rent. They thought it was so scary. After we, we, we went for that, three other projects are now ongoing. It's a built to rent scheme. And now it's one of the, probably one of the most, say, upcoming and promising places to, to do built to rent in Madrid. Yep. I'm really sorry that we have to end the speech already here, but we wanted to let the event be more interactive and let the student ask you questions about yourself, about your career and the project. So these guys and girls, feel free to now ask your questions. Hello, thank you very much for your world. Uh, what about the future of uh, shopping mall? Okay, so um, probably the right ans the correct answer, the polite answer would be that it, it depends on the project. We cannot judge all of them uh, in the same way. Honestly, I'm like, come from that world world, I think it's really challenging. I think it's going to be very tough, and it's going to be very tough for years, for many, many reasons, many reasons. I mean, the main reason, and this is not because COVID, is because we just change the way we waste our money. Back in the days, we waste our, we waste our money mainly in things, and now we're doing experience. You guys waste more money traveling and eating than in buying clothes. Uh, th that's the truth. And COVID, together with e-commerce, has just accelerated that trend. So I don't see a bright future. But, but at the same time, the market has an interesting number of, of opportunities that from a pure cash on cash perspective would make a lot of sense. I mean, shopping centers today can be bought so cheap that you're, if you're able to, to get conviction that that cash flow is stable, you can be sitting on a cash on cash that no other asset class can give you. But it will be illiquid. That's the main problem with shopping malls today. Good evening and thank you for your presentation. Uh, a complete different qu question, but regarding uh, your career and our careers for future uh, worker in uh, real estate, do you think it's necessary to first start with the advisory part, like you did at Savills, etc., and then move to the buy side and the investor side, or we can start working as an investor in real estate, or that part of advisory is really important to understand the uh, uh, the job and uh, the sectors that you have in real estate. Thank you. Okay, that, that, that's a very interesting question. I don't think there is one single clear route to become an investor if this is what you want to be. But I don't think by no means that you can be a good investor, a great investor, without spending a lot of time understanding the needs and the dynamics of your tenants. If the only thing you do is you just you read market reports and you assign the market rent to an asset and you put that in the model on financing and taxes, blah, 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 boom, that's a price, you're going to make a lot of, of mistakes. But if you spend the time to understand why that tenant is going to pay you exactly that rent and not higher or lower, and you spend a lot of time with agents 
challenging them on every single assumption they made to you, then you are going in the right direction. And you don't need to go through, you, not, you don't need to go through the same route as me at all. I don't think so. Further questions? Yes. Um, and, I mean, we know now that you work more in the retail industry, but my question is more about the residential investments. Um, if you now look on the market, uh, we have like high inflation, we have low interest rates, and the prices for residential uh, real estate are increasing, mainly in cities. And now I want to know from you, um, what do you think uh, in the future when like interest rates are going to increase? What will happen with the amount of uh, transaction in the market and what will happen with the prices? A lot of interesting points in your question, thank you. So, in the moment that we are in the cycle so far, the influence of interest rates in what every investor is doing is massive. That's always been that way. And I think it's more than ever. That means that slight change in interest rates could be quite dramatic for many people, really. And that's specifically true for build to rent because build to rent deals are so tight that they amplify every volatility on interest rates. So in other words, if you are buying at 3% an asset instead of buying at 5 a very slight movement has a massive impact on returns. So we are in a much more risky situation than what we think, in my view. And people just don't want to see that. We just keep with the party. Why? Because we are fed up with anabolics. What are th those anabolics? The QE. We continue with the QE, with the, with the quantitative easing, with the cheap money, cheap and cheap money. It has been there in the market since 2009, 2010. And it keeps being in the market. And no single government, even the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank, is brave enough to disconnect us from cheap money. Probably because the reality is that the global economy has not really recovered on a healthy way from the global financial crisis. We're seeing growth, yes. But with 10 years of cheap money, what would have happened with, without that? Probably the outlook would have been very, very different. So on PRS, where there are very strong fundamentals towards PRS, that's a matter of risk, honestly. The second matter of risk is that the product doesn't exist in many jurisdic jurisdictions. Are you from Germany? Okay. That's a much more experienced market. Germany and the Netherlands are much more experienced markets. But big, big markets such as the UK, for instance, not even in Spain, just the UK. It's a very nascent market, really. So that means that many investors are just learning. And where you are, you are learning, assuming an exit cap rate of three or three and a half, wow, there is a lot of room for making mistakes. Hi, um, I don't know if you heard about the um, Decentraland case in June, but basically a virtual plot of land was bought on a, an online game for almost a million dollars. And I wanted to know your opinion on this, if you think that virtual real estate is, uh, uh, has a, a strong growth in the future and that we're in the early stages of something big, or on the contrary, that it's kind of a scam or it's not worth uh, our interest? I have not that much experience on that, uh, honestly, but what I heard about it makes me be quite positive, really, yeah. So I, 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 didn't th I, I think so, but it, it's hard for me to make a statement, honestly, without being, having a personal experience on that.
Thank you for your presentation, first of all. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, regarding the Valdebebas build to rent project, you were mentioning different market testing tools that you were doing in order to test the appetite for your product. I wanted to ask how do you determine the line between obtaining valuable market information and letting all the market know what you're doing and your competitors know what you're planning? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, when we did this blind listing, very few people in the market knew that we were doing that project. We were, that was on the due diligence phase, and it was a turnkey. So a local partner, Colacciona, just bought a piece of land for us, and in the process of discussing the price and discussing how the project should look like, we went through all that marketing tools, and we kick out the, the, the advertising later, later on. It's true, honestly, I think that much more important from at what prices are we are doing the underwriting, I think that the, the most important knowledge um, that we are using, putting on, 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 on this project to generate value is design. It's extremely important when you are, you are in the need to optimize the project in such a way that the really the boundary be, between making a very good return and losing money is quite thin. The design can really make the difference. Architectural design, interior lay layout, not having stupid empty space, optimizing everything and optimizing the PNL of the of the scheme. Why? Because in Spain, I don't know in Germany, maybe in other jurisdictions, but in Spain you don't charge service charges to the tenants. So if you're able to deliver a great service with an optimal service charge leakage, boom, you got it. Then you have found the holy grail of build to rent. Because in many cases, the difference between making money or not is if you're able to reduce your leakage from 22 to 19 percent, which was the case. The only way to do that is to get big, be really big, because you get a lot of economies of a scale, but at the same time you're assuming a huge leasing risk. So you have to, you need to have a, such a strong conviction on what you're doing, on the pricing and the product and the location. When you get that, then for us it was super clear, just go as big as we can. Perfectly. Thank you very much for your opinion and uh, for this time, guys, I need to finish the Q&A here because we have food and drinks outside waiting for you, but we very much appreciate it, uh, you as a speaker here. We thank you for your time and for this. We want to give you a little present from the Reels Association, from the students and from ACP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, nice tie. Thank you. So, guys and girls, I would really like to let you outside and uh, enjoy our food and drinks outside and see you there.